In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. Tomorrow we celebrate the great feast of the Pentecost, closing out Easter season. And Pentecost always reminds me of high school chemistry class in the sense that Jesus goes into heaven and then there's this like silence for 10 days and then there's this explosion. And so the highlight of high school chemistry was always, is the thing going to explode, right? And you have to wait for the, for the reaction. Just the other day, I saw a teacher, a middle school teacher at the boys' school, pouring lemon juice into Drano in the parking lot. And the boys were there kind of waiting for something to happen. Not much happened. There was just kind of some bubbles or just gas. But if you mix Mentos and Diet Coke, well, that's impressive, right? It's a huge explosion. And so this is a little bit like what happens on the Feast of Pentecost, that Jesus in his glory and his triumph and his great love for us going into God causes this divine spiritual reaction that the love of God, because of what Christ did for us on the cross, because of the triumph in his resurrection, the love of God himself is poured out upon humanity, upon the church. And so, Lord, we can ask you, help us to open ourselves to that love, Help us to receive the Holy Spirit. And that chemical reaction is something that continues, that when the Holy Spirit comes down, he wants to transform our souls. He's like a chemical spiritual agent in our souls, changing everything, giving new energy and life to everything. Come Holy Spirit, we pray with the church's Veni Santi Spiritus. Come, Holy Spirit, send forth the heavenly radiance of your light. Come, Father of the poor. Come, giver of gifts. Come, light of the heart. Greatest comforter, sweet guest of the soul, sweet consolation. In labor, you are rest. In heat, you are temperance. In tears, solace. O most blessed light, fill the inmost heart of your faithful. Without your grace, there is nothing in us, nothing that is not harmful. Cleanse that which is unclean, water that which is dry, heal that which is wounded, bend that which is inflexible, fire that which is chilled, correct what goes astray. Give to your faithful those who trust in you, the sevenfold gifts, grant the reward of virtue, grant the deliverance of salvation, grant eternal joy. A beautiful hymn to the Holy Spirit, who on this feast is coming down once again upon the church and once again upon each one of us. So we want to open our hearts to it. Come Holy Spirit, come into me. Cause a spiritual reaction, like a chemical reaction in my soul, Change what needs to be changed. The Latin is very beautiful. I won't repeat the whole hymn in Latin, but this part I think is especially striking. O lux pietissima, replic cordis intima, tuorum fidelium. Sine tuo numine, nil est in omine, nil est in noxium. Lava quota sordidum, riga quota aridum, sana quota saucium, flecte quota rigidum, fove quota frigidum, 
rege quod est devium. Words that speak to us of change, right? Of renewal, of healing. O most blessed light, fill the inmost heart of your faithful. Without your grace, there is nothing in us that is not harmful. Cleanse that which is unclean, water that which is dry, heal that which is wounded, bend that which is inflexible, fire that which is chilled, correct what goes astray. And so we can look, Lord, into our hearts with your light, with the help of the Holy Spirit. What do I need? What in me is a little bit cold, a little bit indifferent that needs to be fired? What in me is wounded that needs to be healed? What in me is a little bit off and has gone astray or is a little bit bent? It needs to be corrected or bent back to shape. Where am I? A little bit off the track. And send the Holy Spirit, Lord, so that we can react. We can let him help us. And Jesus is so insistent on the um, readiness of the Father to give us the Holy Spirit. And if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? And so, of course, right, parents don't on purpose give their children bad things, even though we're sinners. And so Jesus says, how much more will the Father give, not just good things, but God himself, right, the Holy Spirit to those who ask. In the Gospel of John, we read that God does not ration his gift of the Spirit. It's not a scarce resource. Okay, this is a little bit for you, a little bit for me, a little bit for you. Make sure you don't eat too much. You know, it's abundant. He doesn't ration the gift of the Spirit. And so it's a great and daring thing for us to do on the Feast of Pentecost is to say, Father, give me the Spirit. Jesus, give me the Spirit. Help me to tap in to what has been given to me abundantly in confirmation, is given to me abundantly in communion, is given to me abundantly on the Feast of Pentecost, which is you, the gift of God, sweet guest of the soul. And how do we, how do we leverage or maximize our access to the Spirit? How do we make sure the chemical reaction it's supposed to have in our soul actually happens? Because it's always there, right? And so the question is, well, how am I accessing it? How do I break through to it? A number of years ago, I saw an interesting documentary called Touching the Void. It's an incredible story. It's about two English mountain climbers who climb a peak in the Andes in Peru in 1985. And it's one of these crazy climbs that had never been done before. And they make the peak all right, even though it's very difficult. But then on the way down, disaster strikes. And there's a storm, and one of the guys falls into a crevasse, breaks his leg. And the other guy's shouting down into the crevasse his name, but he doesn't hear back from him. So he thinks he's dead. And so he leaves him. And the other guy eventually makes his way down to camp. And the finale is this crazy scene where they're in the base camp and they hear this voice of this guy. You know, they're like, is it his ghost? <laughs> they think the guy's dead. And he's there, ah, kind of just like limping and dragging himself into the camp. But one of the cool things that was surprising for me was they're stranded on the top of this mountain and it's covered with snow. And one of the biggest dangers that they're facing is dehydration. They can't get enough water from the snow, which is abundant, to keep themselves alive. Why? Because they're running out of gas, right? If they have enough gas, then they can create enough fire to burn enough snow. But they're running out of gas because they're up there too long. And so even though they're covered with snow, 
where they're surrounded by snow, they can't access it, right? It can't come to them in a form which is actually helpful. And it's maddening, right? Because they're like, oh, I can, you know, they're trying to eat snow, they're trying to melt it, they're, but they can't get enough liquid out of the snow just by eating it um, to actually hydrate. And so it drives them crazy because they can smell the water in the snow, they know the water's in the snow, but they just can't get enough out. And then even worse, when the guy comes down past the snow line, he's walking down these rocks, dragging himself with his broken leg, and he can hear the water in huge streams running under the rocks, like a river of water under the rocks while he's dying of thirst. But he can't get through the rocks, obviously, to the water, but it's right, it's like a couple meters away, right? And so it's in addition to trying to keep moving, he's got to like battle this constant um, thirst and which is exacerbated, of course, by the presence of the water that he can't get to. And so I think at times in our life, something like this is happening, that our soul is dying for grace. Right? It's dying for the Holy Spirit. It's, it's thirsty for God and God's inspiration. And God's inspiration is close, but so far, right? It's like right there in the snow, but we don't have enough gas to get it out. Or it's right there a couple of meters under us, but we don't have a drill, right, to get through the rock to access it. And so what's the spiritual drill? Or what's the spiritual fire and gas that helps us to access what's already there? Well, with the Holy Spirit, it's something like docility, Right? It's something like sensitivity to pick up on what God wants us to do. Right? That's the great attitude that we have to have towards the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is a teacher. Jesus, you say that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all the truth, and he will teach us all things, and remind us all the things that you taught us. The Holy Spirit is sanctifier, but in his sanctification, He's teacher. And the great virtue of a student is docility, right? Is willingness to be led. And so as we ask, Lord, for the coming of the Holy Spirit, we also ask you to move our freedom, right? Move our will. Because we can't access him unless we want to, and we can't do it without docility, and we can't be docile unless we do it freely. And at times, this is something very simple. I mean, it's not like, it's not like we always have to find some huge, complicated answer to our problems. The greatest pieces of advice, many times, very simple things that we do just because we're being humble and just because we're being docile and, it, you know, it can create a huge change in our attitude. This happens to the prophet Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. I always loved that simple description of docility, right? He hears something from God, but it's very simple, very humble. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, right? He didn't go and do, do something else or wonder, oh, why the potter? Well, I never liked the potter. How can the potter be God's agent? And, you know, I'm allergic to clay. And, you know, it's like, you know, it doesn't get complicated about it. It's like, okay, if this seems like what God wants me to do, simple, but hey, I'll do it. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And the saints 
have latched on to this line. Just like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. That our souls are clay in the potter's hand. And many spiritual authors, saints, have used this image that the Holy Spirit as sanctifier is sculptor. And he sculpts precisely sanctity in us, which is you, Lord. He sculpts us into the image of Christ. But perhaps what we don't latch on to in that beautiful image, very powerful, the great image of docility, to have the docility of clay in the potter's hand. What we miss is that it has to be reworked, right? It doesn't come out right the first time. And who knows how many times it had to be reworked. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. And so in our spiritual life, there's going to be lumps, right? There's going to be cracks. There's going to be, and it's not that the, it's not that that version was terrible. It is what it is. And it, it, it is as it has to be at that moment. But yet it needs to be reworked, right? It needs to be broken back down into clay and then reformed better again. And this is so important, right, that the church sings about these things with regard to the Holy Spirit. And they don't just apply like one time in our life, but they apply at different stages in our life and perhaps many times. Fire what is chilled, correct what has gone astray. Bend back, straighten out what has been bent, heal what has been wounded. Just like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And this is a basic thing, Lord, in our interior life. This is your attitude, readiness to do God's will. I have come to do your will, O Lord. Hebrews describes Jesus' attitude on coming into the world. I have come to do your will. And Jesus, you yourself describe it. I only do what pleases him. I only do what pleases the Father. And so in many talks and many exhortations, when we want to move people to take something seriously, or when people want to move us (laughs) to take something seriously, they say something like this, right? Hey, this is like one of the most important things, right? This is really important. This is fundamental. And it's like the boy who cried wolf, right? That if everything is really important and fundamental, well, then we kind of tune, <laughs> tune things out, right? So the discern, okay, what's really important for me? But I think we can say this about the silly to the Holy Spirit without exaggerating that this is really, really important, right? For our interior life. We pray it in the fa- our Father, right? Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done docility to God's will. And wherever we can get it, right? I'm not into dreams, like, of course, right? (laughs) Kind of new age. But I had a dream the other night that helped me. I dreamt that I was in Rome again, where I was from 07 to 11. And I was with this guy, a couple of guys, but this one guy, great guy, just a great guy. He's a priest now, Nico de Lujan. <laughs> and, um, and I was talking to him and he gave me great advice in my dream. <laughs> and it was very simple. So after I got this advice in a dream from him, after like, one and a half years of not having messaged him or anything. I thought I'm going to tell him that he appeared to me in a dream. (laughs) Gave me good advice. At the risk of kind of freaking him out. 
but he knows I'm not all there. Anyway, Nico, you appeared in a dream I had last night. You gave me good advice. Thanks. <laughs> and then he wrote back, ha, 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 John. I just woke up and read your message. I wish you were in my dreams too. Not yet. <laughs> I, I wish you were in my dreams too. Not yet. But you're in my prayers always. Big hug, which is a Spanishism, right? Fuerte abrazo. Anyway. So wherever we can get the advice that helps us, you know, let's, let's get it. And that's an important gift of the Holy Spirit, right? The gift of counsel. I think, at least I did, I think sometimes we might think of the gift of counsel as the gift of giving advice to others, right? Giving good advice to others. And if you read Aquinas on this, his view is actually the gift of counsel is the gift of receiving advice, which is fascinating. And of course, we need the Holy Spirit to give advice. We need the Holy Spirit to guide others. But for St. Thomas, right, the gift of counsel is the gift of receiving advice, not relying on our own judgment. And again, many times this can be something very simple. Obedience to those who have the responsibility of guiding our souls. Obviously, the duty of our state in life, a simple next step, I go down to the potter's house. Lord, keep me from pessimism, from cynicism. Sometimes that can happen to us, right? I'm so old that it's too late to change this. This is too big of a problem. It's never going to be different. God has run out of patience with me. And all of that is false, right? It's a lack of belief in the power of God. The Holy Spirit is all powerful. This great agent of change. And what, what undoes the pessimism, the cynicism, which is really just reliance on our own judgment, is simplicity. Simplicity. Go to the potter's house. So I went to the potter's house. The simplicity of children, spiritual childhood. I'm a son of God, right? I'm a daughter of God. The Holy Spirit is in my life and God can do all things. Confidence. Lord, that you can, that you can change me. Lava quotas sordidum riga quotas aridum sana quotas saucium flecte quotas rigidum fove quotas frigidum rege quotas devidum devium cleanse that which is unclean water that which is dry heal that which is wounded bend that which is inflexible fire that which is tri- chilled correct what goes astray. And so perhaps, Lord, an act of faith. I believe in God, the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, the sanctifier, the sculptor of my soul. And perhaps, Lord, also petition. Give me the gift of counsel. Give me the gift of knowing how to tap in to the grace that surrounds me with docility, with the humility and simplicity that docility presupposes. And maybe you have this experience, you know, that you get some advice in spiritual direction or you get some advice in confession and it doesn't make much sense or it seems too simple. Where you think, well, that's too simple. This person doesn't really understand me. And maybe they don't. Maybe, maybe, they don't, maybe they don't get it completely. But perhaps you've had the experience of doing it anyway, 
just because you're trusting right? and just because you're trying to be docile and, and humble and obedient. And it tends to work out. It tends to work in spite of its seemingly simplistic nature or in spite of the nagging thought that you think it's not going to work or the person doesn't get you completely or whatever. It tends to work. And perhaps also <laughs> you've had the experience of not listening to the advice and continuing to go through a difficult time that could have been made easier and then reflecting back on it and saying, after I've been through all this, which is probably part of God's plan for you to go through all that and live the consequences of your stubbornness, <laughs> um, you look back and say, now that I think about it, that was great advice that that person gave me. And so it wasn't so much the advice, it was my lack of insight, right? Or my lack of trust or my lack of experience, but especially probably of insight or understanding. I had this experience with a friend recently who went through a very difficult time in his life. And he was telling me that um, at one point, a priest told him, look, what you have to do is uh, abandon yourself in God and just live mercy and understanding with this person who is hurting you so much instead of like fighting it and, you know, trying to win. Because he was in a big conflict in his life. And <laughs> this guy's very funny. And he was like, he said, yeah, I was there looking at the priest, kind of smiling, shaking my head. But at the same time, I, I was thinking, you idiot, that's not at all what I, <laughs> what I have to do, right? And so he continued to fight it and he went through all this pain in his life. And then coming out the other side, he said, that was great advice. That's what I should have done. And so, Lord, give us counsel, give us wisdom, give us understanding, right, to all these attitudes to help us to tap in to the grace, which is your will, right? your will which surrounds us, your will which is never far from us, your intent for our life in the long run and in the short term, like that snow that surrounded those hikers and that river of water that was under the rocks, right? Give us the means that they didn't have to tap into that will. And the means are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, counsel, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and the basic attitude of docility, humility, simplicity. To do what might seem obvious, but with that faith that it comes from you somehow, no matter where we find it, right? Even in our dreams. Although again, I'm not a, you know, I'm not, saying you should like analyze your dreams too much. But if it, if they're helpful, why not, right? Go for it. We go to Our Lady, spouse of the Holy Spirit, spouse of the Holy Spirit. And what does that mean? Well, it means that, it means surrender, right? It means vulnerability. To be a spouse is to be vulnerable, is to be open, is to be receptive. And Our Lady does this completely with God. And we too can foster the attitude of surrender, of vulnerability, of abandonment in God the Holy Spirit on this great feast of Pentecost. Our Lady, spouse of the Holy Spirit, help us to love the Holy Spirit as you did with everything we have and giving him a free hand, a free reign in our life. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father, Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.